Okay, today I'm going to be sharing with you my story of healing, my healing journey over the past, I mean, it's been probably 12 years at this point now. I am 36. Uh, I will be turning 37 this year. I've been putting it off because it's kind of difficult to go back in time all the way to kind of the beginning of my healing journey and lay everything out. And when I started doing that the other day, writing in my notebook, I actually got pretty emotional about it. Um, just looking back on everything that I've tried and done and and what's happened over the years. And so I don't say that in a, in a sad way necessarily, but it's just, it's a lot. And I think um, it's time for me to share uh, a lot of that today in hopes that it could inspire or encourage someone who is feeling um, some of the things that I'm gonna describe as I go along. There have been times where I've felt very, very alone and very sick and hopeless and desperate. And so I am sharing this not because it's comfortable for me, not because I necessarily want to, you know, talk about a lot of this stuff, but because I think stories inspire other people, stories help us relate, and stories can change your life. I know that's been my experience. I figured I would just throw mine in and see, uh, hopefully it it can help someone. So I'm going to start by following my notes today. When I first realized that there was something wrong was when I was about 15 or 16 years old. I was in high school, and I remember being a sophomore in high school, and I started having severe gut pain. I was having um, times where, usually it was in the mornings, right after I would get to school, and I would find myself sitting in my first class, and all of a sudden, it's like all the blood would drain out of my head. I would be like crouching over, almost doubling over in in pain. Um, It was like cramping, a gripping, pinching terrible gut pain and uh i would start sweating like i remember getting sweaty palms like i'd get hot and sweaty and just this something would come over me and i would just be in this like spasm and i'd have to excuse myself from class uh to go to the bathroom and i would be stuck in there for sometimes an hour Um, this didn't happen every day but it was something that just started occurring kind of out of nowhere and I didn't understand why it was happening. I just sort of assumed that I must be normal. Everyone must have this because I think that's what you think a lot of the times. And um, so that just began happening and I would have diarrhea and bowel pain and a lot of just really uncomfortable, painful symptoms uh, three, four times a week, sometimes more. I would come back from lunch or something like that and after eating and I would be um, sick in the bathroom. And it's one of those things where no matter how much you go, it's like it doesn't get any better. Um, it doesn't, nothing really relieves the pain. And so you, I'd just be sitting there for like a long period of time, basically skipping class because I, I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't control it, anything like that. And that's very embarrassing. And so I didn't want anyone to know. I didn't want to tell anyone. I didn't want to talk about it at all. And so I didn't, basically. Um, I just dealt with it. And maybe people thought I was cool because I was skipping class, but I wasn't cool because I was suffering in the bathroom by myself and hoping no one would find out. And so that basically went on until I, after I graduated. Then after that, I went out on my own and I got a job and I started uh, working in restaurants and I started drinking alcohol in my early 20s, maybe late teens. And so that's going to play a role as we go through this story. Um, but there, there was something that struck me in my early 20s that this had to be my diet. I just kind of always knew that. I just thought, okay, well, it's got to be something I'm eating. Maybe it's because it was gut pain. And so I just associated that with something that I'm literally digesting. And maybe it was something more intuitive than that. But I, there was never any question in my mind that 
this was something that I just needed to go get a pill for or do something else for. It was like, I can fix this by figuring out what to eat and what not to eat. And maybe that's where I should start. And so that's when I started uh, really getting into just reading on the internet, reading books, looking at different health resources and trying to figure out, okay, well, what's the right diet that's going to help me with this and make me feel better. And one of the first uh, ways that I started experimenting with diet was through the blood type diet. And I got that. I think someone gave me that book, to be honest. I don't even remember buying it, but uh, I think someone gave me that book and I thought, wow, this makes a lot of sense, right? Different people have different blood types. That must mean that different people, you know, maybe are more genetically or for some other reason uh, predisposed to eat a certain way and I just must be eating the wrong diet for my blood type. Well, uh, my blood type, I got my blood tested. It told me that I should eat a vegetarian diet, that I should remove meat from my diet. I, I could have, I think, eggs and like low fat dairy and things like that. But it said, you know, focus on whole grains, legumes, vegetables, fruits, all that kind of stuff, oatmeal, things like that. And so I started doing that. And I, um, I don't know really honestly how long it was because I, my, the pain got so much worse. And um, I was starting to experience frequent constipation at this time where, you know, I would not have a bowel movement for a week or it would be extremely painful, this combination of sort of the, the IBS D type stuff that I was experiencing more as a teenager. Now it was sort of more of the constipated thing. And this made my constipation way, way, way worse. And so I, um, it wasn't long before I thought, okay, well, this isn't helping me really in any way. Um, and then I had a friend who I uh, had met and was hanging out with, and she told me about colonics and that I could go to a person who was certified to give these treatments. Basically, they stick a tube up your bum and they pump a bunch of water in there and they flush out your colon. And so I thought, well, that sounded great to me at the time because I was like, I can't go to the bathroom on my own. It's or it's a, a big problem. And so I started going and getting these treatments. And I would get them once a week. And they weren't crazy expensive, but they weren't cheap either. And so this kind of started to rack up over time. And at the same time, I didn't want anyone to know that I was getting these done. And so I kind of started to live in this secret life of, oh, I'm going to go to the mall or, oh, I'm going to go meet with this friend of mine so that the people I was living with wouldn't find out that I was getting these treatments. And it seemed to help for a while, but there were actually side effects to this that were so, I mean, it was almost as bad as not getting them at all. The fatigue that I would feel after um, getting this done, it was like I would be out for the next 24 hours at least. I would purposefully schedule my visits on a day where I had a day off of work following it because I would be so incredibly tired and um, frankly feel pretty depressed after, after that. And I would have loose stools and basically not be able to... Um, you know, I'd have to run to the bathroom on demand for like the next day to day and a half. And I'm in my mid, my early 20s at this time, you know, and so I'm trying to have friends and I'm in the, the party scene working in restaurants. I just became a bartender. It's, it's kind of a, a difficult thing to deal with uh, when you're trying to be fun and have friends and go out and then you're kind of like laid up for two days every week because of your bathroom issues. And so, but I felt like, you know, it must be doing something good for me because I'm uh, I'm getting all this stuff out of me that, that really won't come out in any other way. But I was also reading more into diet and I was really still hung up on the vegetarian thing. I was convinced that that was the best diet and I started following this person. Um, I think his name is Andreas Moritz and I got his book, Timeless Secrets of Health and Rejuvenation, I think is what it's called. And I read that book cover to cover. And it also said, you know, don't eat meat. Meat is bad for you. It's toxic. It'll give you cancer. And you need to do like juicing and cleansing and vegetarian slash vegan diets. And so that's when I thought, well, maybe I'm just not doing vegetarian, right? Maybe I need to go more strict and go vegan. And so um, at that point, this had been probably a few years. 
And, and during that time, I would just kind of go back and forth between trying to be really healthy, but the things that I was trying to do didn't help. And so then I would just kind of be like, well, screw it. I'm not going to try. And I would go back to like drinking a lot and just kind of eating whatever junk food. But this is also the period of time when I, when looking back, I did start to develop this fear of eating because every time I ate, I would get sick. I do have to run to the bathroom and I'd be stuck in there for an hour to two hours, or I would be in a social situation where I was, I couldn't do that. And so I would be like, just, I couldn't focus on anything but the pain and trying to not go to the bathroom. And also, so like it, it really started to consume my life and it started to just, I was like, well, I just don't want to eat then. I don't really want to eat anything because I'm afraid that this is always the result every time I eat. And so I would drink a lot of alcohol and then I would not really eat. And so that, and then when I'm hung over the next day, then I would kind of go out and binge more on some junk food because actually junk food didn't make me feel as bad as eating whole grains and vegetables and fruits and all these kinds of whole foods. And so this looking back is where I started to develop the sort of perfect storm of a restricting and binging eating habit because I was afraid to eat, I was afraid to be sick, but then obviously at some point you have to eat and I was using alcohol to kind of mask the pain and and the symptoms that I would feel and so then I would, you know, get into the cycle. And so that's kind of where that began and that has been the hardest thing to break for me over the years. Um, So I, I was learning more about the vegan diet, I was, you know, kind of convinced that that's what I needed to try. And so I believe this about when I was 24, maybe, I decided to try raw vegan. And I, so I just ate, you know, fruits and vegetables, I would cut them up, bring them in my lunch to work and stuff. And I remember, I was probably about a week or two into this, I started getting so dizzy at work that I, I was legitimately afraid I was going to black out and and fall on the ground. Um, And I was so bloated and uncomfortable and constipated and could not go to the bathroom that I was like, I don't even, I don't know how I'm going to work. Like I can't, I don't have enough energy to stand on my feet, but I still tried to, you know, I think I did really raw vegan for like a couple of months before I was like, I like, I can't live like this. You know what I mean? Like this is not... And, and I know there's a transition period and they all tell you it's going to take a while and stuff. So I tried to give it a fair chance, but it was just so, I just felt so bad. And so that is again, a point where I kind of got to this desperate place of despair. It's like, well, I, I should not be feeling like this. I should not be in my early to mid twenties feeling this terrible. And again, with the, the feelings of loneliness and being alone. These aren't things that are easy to talk about with other people. It's very hard to kind of, again, have this sort of secret life of being sick and trying to hide that and and be like, yeah, I'm fun and hip and happy and I feel great and let's party. And it's like, but I just, I kind of want to curl up and die right now. Like that's honestly how I felt um, for a lot of my 20s. And this is again where alcohol became a painkiller for me. It became an emotional painkiller, but also a physical painkiller. Because when I would not eat for a day or two days, but I would have some drinks at night, I actually felt pretty good. You know, those were the times where I um, physically felt the best, oddly enough, because I was getting rid of some of the pain and then not putting things in that were causing the immediate reactions that I was used to getting. Okay, and I wanted to mention this about the person who I was receiving the colonic treatments from. Um, She would tell me that I had, you know, a massive buildup of yeast. And so I started learning about candida and yeast, you know, internal yeast infections. And I didn't really have any other symptoms at that time. But every time I would go in, she would be like, dang girl, you got a lot of this. And I would also have, I don't even know if I'm going to tell you some of the other stuff, but I mean, after I would get those treatments done, um, it, it was scary sometimes to see what would come out after that. And so that was always terrifying to me. Like what is happening inside my body? Um, exhaustion, the brain fog, the brain fog was so bad. Now we're at my mid twenties and this is when I started having some other things happen. I was at work one day 
And I hadn't had any like major attacks, which I, I'm just calling them attacks because that's what they feel like. Um, until I was at work one day, it was, you know, I was on the lunch shift behind the bar and I got one of those things where it was like, it just, it curls you over in pain. It's like someone punches you in the gut with like a red hot knife. That's what it felt like. Um, and it would be like very intense for a short period of time and then it would kind of ease off. And then I, you know, then I'm just like, what do I do? You know, there's people sitting all around me. I'm literally in the middle of this giant U-shaped bar serving people lunch, beers, whatever. And it's like, what am I going to do? I can't go to the bathroom. I can't, you know. And so I ended up finding a minute and going back to my manager and was like, I think I have to go home. Like, I am really sick. I don't know what's wrong with me. I think I might have to go to the hospital. And so I had to wait like two hours till they could find someone to come and replace me for my shift. But I eventually got to leave and um, I got someone to give me a ride to the hospital and got a CAT scan. And my CAT scan came back clean. They said, there's nothing wrong with you. You don't have any blockages. There's nothing, you know, wrong with your colon, your digestive system. We couldn't see anything. And I thought, okay, what the hell was that then? Like, what, what should, what, where did that come from? Like, I didn't imagine this. This was real. And it was sort of just like, well, there's nothing there. So, you know, we don't know. Go home. So again, this this just uh, added to my frustration because I, I didn't know what else to try at that point. And then shortly after that happened, I broke out in uh, psoriasis. I have a form, or psoriasis expresses itself in the gutate form. I believe that's how you pronounce it. So I don't get like the big red scaly elbow patches that, that you might think of when you typically think of psoriasis. I get... Um, they're like little leopard spots, little like perfectly round circles. They almost look like bug bites or, or like a pimple at first, but then they just kind of turn into these spots and they're very scaly and itchy and they look like psoriasis, but they're, and, and so I got this all over my entire body. And when I say all over my entire body, I mean all over my entire body. It was like getting chicken pox, but in psoriasis form. And I thought I had chicken pox for a minute. I was like, I've had this when I was a kid. What the hell's going on? This seemed to happen just out of nowhere. I'd never had this before. And then all of a sudden I'm covered in psoriasis. So I went to the dermatologist because I was scared. And the dermatologist, of course, they at that day, they happen to have like four medical students there. So they all come in with their clipboards and I'm naked with a gown on and they're all looking at me and like, looking at all my spots and it was like just very embarrassing and very um you just feel like you're on display for everyone to look at you and it's it's just uncomfortable anyways I went there and uh she gave me some steroid cream and said you need to put this on every single spot all over your body um like twice I think a day or maybe three times a day something like that And then she came over to me and whispered, like got quiet after the other, the students had left. And I I don't know why this sticks in my memory, but I always remember she came over and she like came up close to me and she goes, you know, we don't really advise this. We don't tell people this in general, but what's really going to help you is to get out in the sun and don't wear any sunblock. And I was living in Florida at the time, so there was plenty of sun. I lived right near the beach. And I thought, why do you have to whisper that? That actually sounds like a great idea. Like, okay, vitamin D, sunlight must have something to do with this. But why do you have to whisper that to me? So I did what she told me. I took the steroid cream and I dabbed it all over my little leopard spots um, two times a day. And I also went to the beach every day and laid in the sun with no sunblock. And it took about, I would say, a good solid week to two weeks before I noticed any difference. But slowly they started to, you know, kind of dry up, turned white. And then I had white spots all over my skin, uh, whereas they had been red and scaly and, and gross before. 
Um, they all turned white and then eventually went away. And so I thought, okay, well, thank God that's over. Thankfully, I have never had another episode that bad um, since then. I think that was like, yeah, like 25 maybe ish years old. Um, but I will, I will get patches from time to time. Usually it's in the winter. Um, it's always actually in the winter, but lately I've actually had some persistent ones that even though I've been getting some sun, they don't want to go away. And so I'll show you some pictures of those. And that's what I'm keeping track of here now as I get a hundred percent strict on carnivore to see if that has anything to do with it, or if it's really more the sun, the low vitamin D or, you know, the sun exposure that's what I need to be increasing. And so again, that was kind of like one of these last straw things where I'm like, no one's really telling me what I need to do. No one has any good advice for me, but they have to whisper things to me sometimes that they feel like they can't say and all of that stuck in my mind. And so that's when I really, really started digging into diet and nutrition and health. And I kind of just shed all hopes of being a vegan or vegetarian because I thought that was not seeming to work for me. And so that's when I found paleo. And I don't know if this site's still up, but I remember uh, reading like every single post that was on the site Paleo Leap. That just everything, it's funny how you, you, you look for an answer for so long and then you hear it and you're like, this makes so much sense. Why didn't I think of this myself? You know, why didn't I figure this out on my own? Everything I read on there was like, oh my gosh, no wonder I've been sick, you know? And so I started immediately eating a paleo style diet. I cut out grains completely and I uh, stopped drinking beer and wine and I just drank liquor because I was still addicted to that for the emotional management because I had very uh, high anxiety, very high social anxiety and um, and then physical pain that I was using this as a tool, um, as a medicine. And so I, but I tried to cut out some of the things that I thought would be the most toxic for my system. And so I focused on whole vegetables, starches, um, and then I added more meat and um, like olive oil, things like that, uh, some more fats, avocados, stuff like that. So went back to very whole foods based, but basically removed all grains. And that really overnight, I noticed a reduction in bloating. I noticed um, a, a small reduction in brain fog. It, it was noticeable, but it was still an issue for me. Um, and I thought, okay, as the longer I do this, probably the better I'll feel. But I, I didn't continue to feel better. I kind of just got a small reduction in symptoms, um, gut issues, brain fog, um, but it, it didn't go much further than that. And so uh, that kind of went on again for a couple of years. And then I basically just started going rogue, I guess. And I went on, I just stopped reading a lot. And I decided, you know what, I'm just going to cut things out as I feel like I need to cut them out and see um, if I get better. And I did start hearing some buzzwords about keto and things like that. And so I, th I think I did do a little bit of reading about keto and just realized, oh, this is a more restricted version of the diet that I'm already doing. I've already removed grains. So why don't I just cut out the starchy vegetables and see if that helps. And so I didn't really like get into counting or tracking my carbs or anything like that in the beginning. I just thought I'm going to cut these things out and see how I do. And I did get better. It was again like, oh, this is a little bit better. I'm having less frequent trips to the bathroom. It was always this battle of like having diarrhea for three days straight or being constipated for two weeks and not being able to go at all. And so, um, and, and always being bloated, always. I would wake up in the morning with a semi-flat stomach and then I would be, um, as soon as I ate anything, I would be like poof, bloated. And that, as a side note too, that's so it's so frustrating because your clothes don't fit. You literally can have to wear like different size clothes from day to day, depending on how bloated you are. And I remember thinking like my, I would weigh myself and be like, I'm not, I haven't gained any weight or lost weight. Like, why can I not fit into these pants? Or why does this shirt just feel so uncomfortable? You know, I look like I'm pregnant 
and then three hours later I won't look like that you know and so like it's just all these little things that add up, which is just like all of this anxiety and stress about eating and being around food. And can I eat in this situation? What's going to happen to me? How am I going to, you know, am I able to make it to the bathroom, blah, blah, blah. Who's going to know? And so while keto did give me uh, some more relief, I still like immediately plateaued and I was still having all these symptoms. And so that really, that's the point when I was like, you know what? I am just going to start cutting things out until I stop being bloated and I stop, you know, feeling exhausted were my main things. Um, Just checking back to see if I missed anything. Oh, I would do all these cleanses. Um, The Kachari cleanse is one that I remember specifically doing. I never really got into juicing, just mainly because juicers are really expensive and I, I was never quite sold on the juicing thing for whatever reason, but I did try some supplements and some shakes, you know, a few of those kinds of things. But I never really got into that stuff as much because I just, again, I just had this thing stuck in my head that it's like, oh, if I can just figure out the right way to eat, I'll be fine. I don't need to add in a bunch of supplements or a bunch of things. But I spent a lot of money on probiotics. I spent a lot of money getting these like top grade, completely whatever they want. You have a large variety of microorganisms. I made my own fermented vegetables. I made my own kimchi, my own sauerkraut, my own fermented carrot sticks, my own uh, cucumbers, fermented cucumbers. And every time I took probiotics or ate fermented foods, again, six months pregnant, in bloating, pain, gas, terrible cramping, could not tolerate it. I even started like by taking tiny amounts and increasing them from high grade, very expensive probiotics that I would get. Um, same exact thing. I could not, literally could not tolerate any of those things. And so this is around the time I went to phlebotomy school. I was thinking I wanted to get into the medical field at some level because I was very interested in all this stuff. I did not end up getting a job as a phlebotomist, unfortunately. Um, had to go back to restaurants again. Um, but anyway, those were some other things. During this time, I was trying all the, to make all these different foods, trying all these different things, cleanses. And then I got into doing, um, because I couldn't afford to do the colonics all the time, I started doing home enemas. And this is where, again, uh, things can get a little addicting. And I started relying on doing these home enemas almost daily at a point. There was a good probably six months of my life where I was doing either just a warm water enema, a salt water enema, or a coffee enema. Those are all the three kinds that I would do at least every other day because I couldn't feel like I could completely eliminate everything that needed to be eliminated without it. It slowly got better, but again, I was having to do these things. I'd be extremely tired, have to lay down for several hours afterwards, have loose stools afterwards um, for about a day. And as a side note, I really noticed the sense of apathy developing kind of like a cloud over my life at this point because I uh, just didn't, I just kind of started accepting that this, this is just who I am. I'm just going to be sick like this. And uh, I, I did, I should mention, I did go see uh, like a, a primary care doctor um, because I had ended up in the parking lot of the emergency room one more time Uh, right kind of before I just made all these other changes and I with that severe pain again but I got to the parking lot someone had driven me and I remember just I'd eaten a subway sandwich that's what it was I'd eaten a subway sandwich and you know how much bread is in a subway sandwich because I was on this restriction and binge thing because I was afraid to eat and I would get so hungry and I would just binge on like lots of food at a time. And so not making the situation better, but that was my way to cope at the time. I had just eaten this big Subway sandwich or most of it and gotten this spasm, this pain, this, you know, and so I ended up in the parking lot of the emergency room again. And I just remember opening the door and vomiting and throwing everything up and being like, oh, now I feel fine. I don't need to go, you know, spend five grand or whatever to be told that I'm fine and I should go home. And so I did seek out advice from 
a doctor and at the time i was also taking a bunch of fiber pills right because we're told oh fiber you just need more fiber if you're constipated and so it wasn't really making a difference i was taking probably 12 to 15 of these fiber pills every day they would produce a bowel movement maybe once every three days or so but it was again i never felt like i had a complete elimination it was always painful but that was i was limping along on these these fiber pills among all these other things. So I did go to the doctor and I asked her, I don't wanna be taking, I told her I don't wanna be taking all these pills, you know, what can I do to fix this problem? And uh, I remember her looking at me. And again, I don't think she had bad intentions, but she didn't know the answer. And so she told me, um, we'll just keep taking the pills. You're getting the result you want. That's all you need to do. And I, rem and I remember <laughs> leaving that office going, that's not why I came to you. That's not why I came to you for you to just tell me to keep doing, just keep putting a Band-Aid on the problem. That's what I've been doing is putting more Band-Aids on this problem. And I've been doing, you know, my own research. I've been trying all these diets. I've been trying all these cleanses. I've been doing home enemas every other day. I've been trying to clean up and eat only whole foods and increase my fiber and exercise and drink a lot of water and blah, blah. I've been doing all of it. And I still don't feel well and it's not helping me. And all you're going to do is tell me, oh, just keep taking the pills. And that's, and that's where connecting back to the, the apathy, it just started to, it just started to be like, this is just how I am. Nobody knows how to help me. I'm going to be afraid of food forever. I'm going to always have to wonder when I'm going to have the next attack, when I'm going to have to run to the bathroom. Am I in a situation where I can do that? How can I hide it? How can I pretend like everything's fine? How can I just wear clothes that are so baggy that you can't tell if I'm bloated all the time? Or I would have really bad gas and I'd be, obviously that's super embarrassing. And so I'd try to like look for a place to go past the gas and then come back, you know, and it's like, it, it just, it completely <laughs> overtook my life. And I got to the point where at that point, I'd already tried every diet. I'd been from vegetarian to vegan, to paleo, to whole foods, to the junk food diet, to the binging and purging diet, to the starvation diet, to the alcohol only diet, to the colonics, the enemas. I looked at Eastern stuff, Western stuff. And now I was at keto, which is all the diets I had heard about as far as, you know, these are the type of, of macronutrient ways that you can structure your, your eating. And so I just developed this sense of just like, well, nothing, food, food means nothing to me anymore. It's not enjoyable. I'm afraid of it. I don't want to eat, but I have to eat. And I have this just completely messed up relationship with food and health and my body. And no one is helping me. And at that time, that's, so that's really when I decided like, I'm gonna go rogue and I'm going to just stop listening to everyone, stop listening to, you know, the people on TV, the diet magazines, the diet articles online, like the studies coming out. Cause there's always a study coming out that says, oh, newest development, you should eat this and you shouldn't eat that. And this is why you're sick. And I would do that and nothing would change. I got down to, I was eating, um, meat and olive oil and organic salad greens with olives, bell peppers, cucumbers, just very limited vegetables that didn't seem to give me, you know, the most bloating. I cut out all fruits. And then one day I remember eating a salad and I got bloated after it. And the thought just popped into my mind. I remember saying out loud to myself in the kitchen, I was alone in the house and I was like, really is meat the only damn thing I can eat? Is that literally going to be my life? Because that was the only thing that I would just, I'd sometimes have just a meal of like a chicken breast or some steak as like a snack and nothing would happen. But that was kind of rare. I'd usually always have some greens or some salad or I'd, I'd usually make a big giant salad and put meat on top and then that was my meals. But there were a few times where I would just eat meat and I would be like, huh, nothing nothing happened. And so that's the day that I decided to just eat meat and stop buying all the greens and the vegetables and the oils and the, all the stuff. And I just started eating steak 
and chicken, bacon and stuff like that. And that's when I kind of went back to the internet and I thought, I wonder if anyone else is just eating meat. I did find this blog called Zero Carb Zen and it was a story of a woman who uh, I read her blog post and I thought, wow, this is so much like me. She had done all these weird mono diets where you, you know, she only ate yogurt for like three months or only ate grapes for six months or something crazy. And, you know, so again, a self-experimenter, somebody who wanted to, to take their health in their own hands and figure this out. And so I thought, she's doing it. Okay, and she's better. And then I started hearing things, you know, I had started having things pop up and I realized, oh, this is called a carnivore diet and you just eat meat and this is like an extreme elimination diet so you can figure out what you can tolerate, what you can't tolerate. And I had kind of gone about it in a backwards way. I'd started with everything, doing all of it, and then slowly cut everything out until I discovered that an all meat diet made me feel good and I went through the transition symptoms and I'm going to try to fast forward a little bit because this is getting really long but this is a long time period and I want to include as much as I can because I think all of it matters but but this so I so I adopted a carnivore way of eating I actually started a YouTube channel and I was talking about that diet way back when but then I started getting a lot of feedback right a lot of comments with a lot of people had questions a lot of trolls a lot of people saying you're gonna die you're stupid, you're a terrible person, you hate the earth, you hate the animals. And I didn't have answers for any of that at that point. All I wanted to do was feel better. And so I got really self-conscious and really overwhelmed and long story short, I ended up stopping making videos. I continued to eat that way for about 11 months, but during that 11 month time, I'm still working in restaurants, I, uh, was binge drinking pretty heavily. And if anyone's been on a low carb diet or a carnivore diet, you know that you, you get much more sensitive to or your tolerance for alcohol goes down. And so I would say like as a net amount, I was drinking less alcohol because I couldn't tolerate as much, but I was still drinking every day. I was still drinking till I was intoxicated almost every night of the week. I had um, during that time, I had, you know, a couple of extremely stress, emotionally stressful events happen in my life. And I leaned hard on the alcohol for that. I leaned real hard on the alcohol because I was, I was starting to feel amazing, like really good, better than I had ever felt in my life that for any time I can remember just eating meat and drinking alcohol and coffee. Of course I had coffee still in my life, but the night and day difference was in freaking credible. I did not have any more bowel pain, no more gas, no more bloating. I went, I started, it took about a month for me to transition, but I was having normal bowel movements that were not painful, that didn't have any blood in them, that had no mucus in them, that had no, it was just go to the bathroom once every day or two, eliminate, feel great, and then move on with my life. Simple meal prep, not stressing about food. I stopped being afraid of everything I put in my mouth because I got this sense of trust back from just eating the meat. It's like, this isn't going to hurt me. And so I'm cool again. But I would every once in a while, because I was still drinking and alcohol turns into sugar, whether it's beer, wine, or hard liquor, I was only drinking vodka and water or soda water. Um, but it's still gets, uh, it's still a poison and it's still like, uh, priority one when you're consuming alcohol, your liver is going to be burdened with that. And so, um, and it, it does affect your blood sugar. And so I was still having these blood sugar swings that would cause me to binge probably every six to eight weeks. I'd have a full on binge of like salty, usually chips, crackers, sometimes cheesecake because cheesecake's my favorite dessert but it was mostly salty stuff that I would always turn to. Comfort foods, again, because of the high level of emotional stress in my life. And then the side effects from drinking were still keeping me in this, I hate to call it, describe it like this, but it, it's like being a slave to sugar. It's like being a slave to these foods because I was not in control of saying no to them um, and, and I'm including alcohol in that because it, it's not technically a food, but it's, I put it in the same box because if I would, you know, lean on, if I would go away from the foods and I would lean on the booze. And if I would 
you know, try to quit drinking and really cut back on my alcohol, I would automatically be having intense cravings for these foods. So it was like I couldn't do, I could do without one, but I couldn't do without both. And and that is something that became extremely apparent to me when I got pregnant. Okay, it's the next day. I'm going to wrap up the rest of the story and tell you where I'm at now. Um, I didn't get to finish yesterday speaking uh, to the rest of the story. So I think I left off at pregnancy. Pregnancy was a very interesting experience. I... It, it really revealed to me that I had a true addiction. I really started to understand the connection between alcohol and these sugary, emotionally triggering foods that I would consume still from time to time. Because before I was pregnant on carnivore, I, I would not have sugar cravings, physical cravings. Those went away. And that's where you get this sense of food freedom. You stop thinking about food. You stop wondering when your next meal is going to be. Like you just sort of fall into this pattern of intermittent fasting and it's just easy and the prep is so simple and you just like all that anxiety goes away. And then once I became pregnant, part of it was feeling terrible. Felt really, really, really bad at the first two trimesters. And then you're quitting everything cold turkey, alcohol, coffee, and I wasn't working out like I had been. And so that was really helping me manage a lot of my stress before that. And so I didn't really have the, the exercise in my life like I, like I wanted. And I just, I just felt very, 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 very tired and sick again. And it was kind of reminiscent of how I had felt before I found the carnivore diet and so mentally and emotionally for me it was it was really hard because it was kind of like being thrown back 10 steps like I had finally taken four or five big steps forward in in healing and figuring out my relationship with these foods and with alcohol and realizing that you know I if I took the alcohol away then the foods would come in and if I took the foods away I, I still couldn't let go of the alcohol and so I started to slowly begin to rely on these foods for emotional support and emotional comfort and when you're very tired and you're kind of sick and you can't go out and party anymore it's just kind of depressing in a way it's it's a very big life change and so all of those things combined um, just really forced me to look at my consumption of these things and how much they still controlled me even though I had made so many strides forward and so since having our baby and I've been trying to get back into low carb again and it's, it's just been a struggle once again and I've finally gotten to a place now where I have let go of the carbs and I at the same time I've let the alcohol come back in and sort of be this habit again it's it's nowhere near the amount that I have drank regularly in the past but it's still that little nagging feeling in the back of my head like you know you're not in complete control of this and and there's still a part of me that uses that to relax and to and I'll have fun and to be in social situations and all those kinds of things. And so what the what the carnivore diet did for me was it allowed it it took the curtain away. It allowed me to see myself and my habits for what they really are, for who I really am, and it forced me to look at that and confront it. And I think my first round of carnivore, I I could I wasn't quite ready to look at it and really be honest with myself about my relationship with food, my relationship with alcohol, my relationship with my emotions. And I've heard other carnivores talk about something similar where it's not that this diet is magical in the fact that it just heals you from everything, but what it does do is it, it pulls the curtain back and it allows you to physically be so satiated that you don't really have sugar cravings. You're not hungry all the time. And so why am I still wanting to eat this? Why do I still want to overexercise? Why do I still want to drown my feelings in alcohol? You know, and then pregnancy being the second kind of, I mean, 
I'm not a maybe classical Christian believer type person, but I, I see God in a lot of this because it's like, I, I had this experience my first round of carnivore and it's like, I, it wasn't enough for me to really be like, no, you have to look at this. And then pregnancy was that other component that, that forced me to look at my life and my habits. And now I'm getting my, my second chance, you know, to like put all of that stuff that I learned together and maybe finally get free from all of this stuff. And so I don't, I'm not the type of person to say that I will never have a drink again or I will never eat a blueberry again or I'll never try to eat a cucumber again. Because as a side note, and to really get this wrapped up, that's what I kind of thought when I got pregnant because my symptoms had, they didn't return in the same like veracity that they had before I went carnivore. Like I didn't have the bleeding. I didn't have the severe bowel pain. I had, I had IBS and I had, you know, some skin issues and tons of fatigue, but I think that was mostly from just being pregnant. And I have heard people say things and I've read things related to the idea that because your immune system is lowered during pregnancy so that you don't attack and fight off the living being growing in your womb, sometimes people with autoimmune issues or gut issues or things like that, they're their symptoms will go down just due to that. And so I th I'm not sure how much of it may have been due to that. I'm not sure how much of it was um, the fact that I still didn't eat very much fiber. I, I didn't, I've really learned that fiber does not uh, help the situation in, in any form or fashion. And so there were, there were tweaks that I still did with my diet, but I still ate like, towards the end of my second trimester and then my third trimester, I basically ate whatever I wanted. And I had t maybe 25 to 40% of the symptoms that I would have had eating that diet before I ever started carnivore. And so that was also something that got into my head, like, wow, maybe I've healed. Maybe I gave my gut enough rest. Maybe I can eat like a normal person again. And I kind of uh, got into this mindset of I'm going to try to eat more just keto or even go back to like paleo and be having more variety and things like that. And there again, it, it's sort of this going back and forth between having more carbs in my life and then hitting that binge cycle again, where it's like, I can, when I'm around, when I eat, a little bit of something, it triggers a binge for me. And so that is basically what I've been uh, wrestling with over the last three years because I thought, oh, I can be normal again. I can introduce things. And I've, again, had to say, you know what? I just don't think that I can. Although I don't have the symptoms to the severity that they were in the past, I still have them. I still have psoriasis right now because of what I've been eating. And also, I think there's a huge component of that, which is vitamin D. And so, um, but all, but that aside, I get bloated still when I eat vegetables. I get constipated. I, if I eat fruit, it's like there, you know, there's no stopping me from eating whatever else is in the house. Even if I co like cognitively in my head know it's going to make me sick, I will cook it and eat it because it's like a drug. And so that's been my experience with this stuff. And so there's a part of it that is purely physical for me. Like I eat these things and they do not digest. I do not tolerate them. But there's also this psychological component of not being able to um, moderate these foods for whatever reason. And so this is kind of the experiment again that I think a lot of carnivores are on. It's like, how long should I eat this way before I try to reintroduce something? And I hear a lot of people say that, um, who have an issue kind of similar to mine, where you feel like the, the food talks to you and tells you to eat it, and it's like something that you really can't get control over. Um, abstaining from that stuff is an option, and it can give you freedom. And you can get all the nutrition you need for meat and you can live a happy life 
feeling good and feeling nourished and and healing some of this stuff we don't have to participate in eating all of these other things and so just having that option and knowing that it's a possibility is is so encouraging and so amazing for me and that's uh what i again hear from a lot of other carnivores and so where i'm at today is i took about three months to wean myself back into a a strict carnivore diet as far as no carbs you know no bites of anything no vegetables no rice no nothing else and i gave myself grace and i let myself have a few screw-ups here and there or you know cheat meals or whatever but um I'm to the point where I feel like I've fully adapted, but I had the alcohol still in my diet. And so now that's the next step where I'm going to, for the first time in my life, remove both of those things from my daily intake. No carbs, no alcohol. I'm keeping coffee for now because I actually tried to quit coffee and alcohol on the same day and I got about through four days with neither and I added the coffee back in because I thought... this isn't going to work with (laughs) cutting all of it at once. But I I assume I I have a goal to try and do a 30-day without coffee eventually and just see if it affects me. I know, I think Sean Baker talks about how he has observed like 50% of people say when they cut it out, they do feel a difference and about 50% of people say they don't. So it's a a coin toss uh, whether or not I will end up keeping that in for the long term, I guess. But this is where I am now. I've, I've come a long, long way. And I feel that my experience with carnivore has given me a chance to get my life back, to get some control over how I feel every day, to get into to really looking at myself as someone that I should take care of and that I should put I should make my health a priority in a way that's loving versus a way that was punishing or that was uh, self-degrading or in in some of the different ways that I've looked at it in the past. And I think there's very significant mental health changes that I've experienced too that I think I'll talk about more in a different video because otherwise this one will be 3 freaking hours long, but And I want to give it some time without alcohol as well to really assess what might be going on there. And so I hope um, this video gave you some information. I'm sure, you know, I know it was a lot to get through. So I appreciate if you listened to the whole thing. This has been a long, long journey for me. And I am sharing it again, not because I'm super excited about telling everyone about my my poop and stuff, but... um, I have great poops now and it's amazing to not have to worry about that every day. I'd love to hear your stories below if you've healed from anything or if you're new to carnivore or you're a veteran um, of carnivore. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon. I'm going to be putting up some more videos about um, budget carnivore meals because I think that's very important to let people know that You don't have to be rich to do this diet. You don't have to get the best, highest quality every single thing for every bite of the carnivore diet. You can get by with what you can afford and you can feel a lot better. So, okay. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon. Bye.